I'm Larry Vickers, the host of TAC TV. I'm a trained firearms professional with years of experience in the industry. So unless you're properly trained, never attempt anything you see on this show, ever. Requested episodes in TAC TV history is fixing to come at you. The HK416, a weapon that I was involved with early on, and a good buddy of mine from HK, Robbie Reedsma, who was involved with the M27 IAR, is here to help me out as a co host on this episode. Okay, before the 416 came along, the guns that were being used for CQB purposes was the M4 carbine with a 14 half inch barrel and also the MP5. And the issue there is the M4 is a great gun and it did very well in the role except it's a little bit too big. The theory is you need a gun that's a little bit more compact, a little bit more towards the size of an MP5 for CQB for confined spaces. Now if you go back to the MP5, great gun, but remember it's a 9mm caliber weapon, meaning you're, you're basically shooting a large select fire, easy to shoot 9mm pistol. Very effective within room distances, but if you step outside and you have to take a shot down a street or whatnot at a guy 100, 150 meters away, you're basically shooting at him with a handgun. So there need to be something that kind of bridged the gap. Now, short-barreled M4 style weapons or CAR 15s have been around since Vietnam. The issue is the direct impingement gas system has limitations in a very short format. That's one of the reasons why Colt settled on a 14 and a half inch barrel. It needs that additional dwell time for the projectile to get past the gas port, build up the pressure to cycle the action before it exits the muzzle. Now, I knew enough about weapons design to know what was really required was a short-barreled weapon with a piston operating system. And, and at the time, we looked at different weapons like the SIG 5.52 and the G36C, and they're both great guns, but the truth be told, much like a 1911, once you get used to the operating system of an M16 or an M4, it's hard to go off on anything else. The, the ergonomics, the safety, the mag release, all that is superb. That's why you're seeing guns today, like the SCAR and whatnot, that have been designed using those controls. So when I went over to Germany on the ill-fated HK-1911 project, really went nowhere, and I was in Ernst Malk's office, a good man who was the CEO of HK at the time. I saw he had a, a blueprint on the wall, and his vision was to make an improved M4. He'd heard reports on the M4 carbine and whatnot, and, and, and where I came from, we really weren't having a lot of those issues. We used the gun in semi-automatic, and we didn't put a lot of high volume of fire downrange. So we didn't have the issues he was addressing, but I knew there was a silver lining in there that, if I could get on board with HK at the time on developing an essentially an improved M4 or an M4 with a G36 style gas system, I could ultimately end up with a gun that I really wanted or that we really wanted in the organization I was in, which was a shorter barreled formatted M4 style rifle with a gas piston operating system that would be ideal for confined spaces. That's where it started. It took a couple years to develop. Uh, the gun worked very well in testing. Initially, it was shipping M4s over to Germany, made sure all that was legal with the government it was. And then the Germans would reverse engineer it, adapt the piston system to it, do testing and whatnot. And eventually it led to the production run of the 416, which is where we see it today. Now there's been tweaks along the line, but the gun is still essentially the same as it was. It came out in roughly 2004. I'm uh, very proud of the fact that the gun has seen widespread use and has been involved in some very, very famous special operations missions within just the last couple of years. Very proud of my involvement with the gun, but that's where it came from. It came from the need for a gun that was smaller, more along the line of an MP5 that gave you more punch like an M4. All right, TAC TV fans, I got Robbie Reedsma here, HK Defense here in the United States. He's gonna take us through the differences between a 10.4 inch HK 416D. This is the full auto gun used by law enforcement and military and an HK MR 556A1, the civilian legal version of the 416. Robbie? Thank you, Larry. The uh, 
the HK416 um, comes in a few different barrel lengths. This one is the 10.4 inch model. There's also a 14 and a half inch uh, barrel, a 16 and a half inch barrel, and a 20 inch barrel as well. Um, the handguard on this is uh, nine inches long. Um, this is gonna be the same length handguard that's on the MR556. Uh, it's got a collapsible buttstock. Same thing as on the MR556 with a collapsible buttstock. There's two different uh, butt pads you can get. One is gonna be a uh, concave style butt pad, um, and then the other one is gonna be a convex. Either one of those can come with the guns. Uh, and those simply just twist right off and right on, so they're easy to replace depending on what your preference is for, uh, for shooting styles. And you got battery storage and whatnot back there, right? Yep, absolutely correct. There's, uh, in the back of the gun, uh, in the buttstock, there's battery storage in the back and there's room for some, uh, some small tools. Uh, there's multiple sling attachment points um, that you can see on the, on the, on the buttstock. Uh, whether you're, you're slinging a web through there, uh, you're actually putting a, a, a snap link hook type uh, sling inside there, or you're feeding something through uh, basically around the tube or through underneath the tube itself. Um, the butt stock itself uh, is, is a little bit more of a snag free design. Um, so you still push in as you would with a normal butt stock. Uh, it's just there's, there's, no, um, there's nothing actually clicking off of there. Uh, or there's no exposed edges. Um, so basically you can slide it that way or you can pull down on the tab right there. Six positions uh, that are available on that. On the uh, HK416, uh, basically it's a uh, gas operated short stroke piston uh, design. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll walk you through that real quick and show you how that differs from a regular gas impingement system. Uh, we'll start off by opening up the free floating rail system on the fore end. There's a, a screw right here that basically locks that into position. Once that screws out, you can slide your rail system right off the front. And then you're going to have your gas block right here. Uh, inside your gas block is going to be a gas piston, which is right here, and then a operating rod or a pusher rod. What this is doing is this is allowing uh, about 90%, 95% of your hot carbon fouling and your, um, your gases and your, your carbon and everything to go right out the front of the gun. Um, and it's only taking what it needs up into that gas piston to actually cycle the gun. And what this is doing is this is actually keeping your bolt carrier back here, your, your working group, uh, your bolt head, uh, a lot cleaner, carbon free with less, uh, less heat transfer. When the system operates, basically that gas piston is probably coming back about a, about a quarter inch, half inch or so, and it's just going like that. Um, that's enough to operate that bolt system. And this is real easy to take down. Um, it's simply you're, you're taking the operating rod out and then your gas piston out. Uh, those two components are easily switched out, easy to clean, easy to get to. Inside your, uh, your upper receiver, you're going to have your bolt carrier. Uh, and your bolt carrier looks like what's common on an M4 or an M16. The big difference is actually going to be um, that there's no gas key. Uh, basically it's all one piece bolt carrier and it's a hardened anvil striking surface right there where my finger's at. Um, that's allowing a, a, a lot more ruggedized version uh, so the top of this is not going to shear off uh, which is common when you'll actually pin, uh, pin that on. Um, on the bolt carrier one of the other features we have is a firing pin safety lever which is a lever that's right on top of the firing pin safety. Uh, as your hammer comes up, that's actually going to allow that to come up and out of the way, and that's allowing your firing pin to go forward and actually ignite the, uh, the primer. And that little key point is going to be, become critical when people look at buying the uh, MR556A1 upper. They have yes. to make sure they have a mil spec hammer in order to trip the firing pin safety. Yes, absolutely correct. There, there's some aftermarket hammers that are out there uh, that won't have the height or the mass to disengage that firing pin safety. Um, again, it's a small amount, but as long as it's big enough to do that, like in a mil spec uh, hammer, yeah, that, that's enough to, to overcome that safety feature. The charging handle is a regular charging handle, just like everything else uh, in the common variation of the 416. Inside the lower receiver, your buffer is going to have a, a red dot on there and the HK logo. Uh, it's a heavier buffer and buffer spring that's inside here. So if you, if you do use our upper receiver uh, on another gun, you need to make sure that you also use that HK buffer and the buffer spring. Um, it's not to say it won't work with something else, but uh, your chances of having a, a stoppage are going to go higher. 
it was developed specifically with that and part of the part of the operating mechanism. I've seen people shoot 416s on semi-auto mm -hmm. with a standard buffer and yep. get by with it, but where you generally see issues with different types of ammo and full auto. Yes, absolutely. It, it's going to definitely work best if they're running the HK buffer and buffer spring with it. Yep, absolutely correct. Good deal. Now, if you would, take us into the MR556, show the similarities and the differences. Okay, and then the MR556A1, which is this uh, system right here, uh, basically it's, it's the same design, same operating system as the HK416, so you're still going to have your gas piston and your pusher rod up top, uh, same bolt carrier. Uh, I'll walk you through what is different on the MR556 commercial variant uh, compared to a government version HK416. So the MR556A1 uh, is basically the commercial equivalent to the HK416. That's going to come with a 16 and a half inch barrel length like you see right here. Uh, nine inch free floating rail system, still got the adjustable butt stock. And most importantly, it's got the, uh, the short stroke gas piston operation. So your internals are, as far as the operating system go, are identical to the HK416. What I'm going to do is I'm going to walk you through some of the differences. Like we said, uh, we've got the, the barrel, uh, which is a 16 and a half inch barrel. It's just available in that one length. Um, I'm going to undo the, the screw to the uh, free floating rail system. And one of the things you're going to see when we take off that handguard um, is you're going to see a bigger barrel profile. Uh, what we did is we increased the barrel profile on here, so that way it's, uh, it's going to lend itself to a more accurate system. Also, the barrel on the MR556 is not chrome lined, uh, so that increases the accuracy as well. Um, going back to the, uh, the rear of the gun, uh, you'll, on the, uh, the charging handle, you'll see it comes with the extended version of the charging handle. And this is also reversible, so uh, you can actually take the pins out and it'll go from a uh, right-handed shooter on the left-hand side to a left-handed shooter on the right-hand side. So you can switch that over as well. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is on the, um, uh, the selector lever, uh, that that's ambidextrous. So again, left-handed or right-handed shooters, that's just coming standard on the gun. It's got a polymer dust cover on that. Uh, your butt stock is six position butt stock. One of the differences on the butt stock is that there's a tool in the back of the butt stock um, so you can twist your butt stock plate open. You can take this, uh, this Allen wrench out and you can actually use this to lock your butt stock in a position. So it takes any, uh, any small amount of play that's inside there, it takes that completely out, locks the whole system up uh, just for a more solid position. Um, one of the things that we, we did differently when it comes to taking the upper and lower receiver apart is you'll notice on the push pins uh, right here and right here the front and rear is these are under a, under a, a detent pressure um, so using that same tool that's coming out of your butt stock uh, you actually push in on that and that's going to allow that to actually come out or you're going to push on it and it'll allow it to close again. What that push pin is doing on the uh, upper and lower receiver connection points is that is actually allowing a completely solid lockup between your upper and lower receiver so that there's no play, no wobble in there. And that's, again, going back to the accuracy, it's increasing the uh, stability of the system uh, into one solid gun. Internally, uh, you can see that it's, it's like any other stoner lower type design or uh, HK416 design. And then, of course, we have our, our heavier buffer uh, with the red dot on there and then have your buffer spring. Inside the, uh, the bolt carrier itself, uh, one of the other differences is going to be a cutout, uh, like a half moon shaped uh, cutout that you can see right here. That is going to align inside the receiver extension and what that does is that uh, allows us so that a HK416 fully automatic bolt will not fit into the MR556 and fire. Basically, it'll, it'll stop. Now, one thing, Robbie, I want to ask. I've been told these pins, push pins, are interchangeable with standard mil spec pins. Is that correct? Yes, that is okay. correct. Um, so if, if, you, uh, if you didn't want the, um, that solid lockup on there, you, you can change that out to a uh, to a regular um, takedown pin that's on a 416 or a, or a you know M4 type lower. Like for somebody who's switching uppers quickly right. and whatnot and doesn't right. really want that feature. Correct. Okay. Now, 
Also, one of the things I want to point out we were talking about on camera is the ability for this gun to go on safe with the hammer forward, which is unlike other M16 AR style weapon systems. Yes, absolutely. Um, we, one of the, uh, the, the safety design, uh, when we went back and, and uh, redesigned some of this gun, is that was one of the features, uh, just to, to allow the gun to be a little bit more safe. Which I'm a fan of, by the way. That's yep. one of the things, and remember in the real world, you take the average guy who's not really a gun guy in the military mm -hmm. or let's say law enforcement, um, they're keeping their finger on the trigger maybe at the wrong time and they're right. loading and unloading the gun. It sets up the conditions for them to have an accidental discharge. Correct. If you can leave the gun on safe, that's just another measure of safety. And I, I'm a fan of it. I thought it was a great feature. Yep. Uh, kudos to the Germans for that. Yeah, what we'll do is uh, the, the gun's charged and it's clear. It's it's on fire right now. Pull the trigger, goes goes click. But yeah, we can still swip our uh, click the uh, selector right back over it on onto safe, even though the the trigger's already been pulled. So yeah, absolutely a a, a, a more safe design for and the average shooter. And that's a standard feature with all HK small arms. This gun's unique because it really came from a pre-existing gun. And the M16 and M4, and then the Germans kind of redesigned it and kind of put their twist on it for the 416. So this is something they kind of now they're bringing this back around to where they've been from the G3, MP5, yes. you know, right down the yep. line. Absolutely correct. It's it's all about the uh, it's all about the product improvements. Um, basically, is you know you always want to take your product and make it better and, and more user uh, friendly to everybody that's out there. Now, next thing we're going to do here. Uh, we're going to get a mil spec lower. I have a Bravo company lower that our good friend Paul Bravo sent us. And we're going to put this upper on the Bravo company lower and light it up. Stand by for that. All right, time to test fire the conversion here. Got the BCM lower, the HK MR556A1 upper installed. Let's see how it goes. Okay, runs like a champ. Now, two things to be aware of. You want to make sure you swap out the buffer and buffer spring with the unit that comes with the HK upper. And make sure you have a mil spec hammer in terms of the height of it and the profile will trip the firing pin safety in the MR556 upper. You do that, it should run like a champ. All right, Robbie, run us through this test. Uh, this is going to be the water test for the HK416. Uh, basically, we're going to load up the gun, uh, put it in the water, let it sit there for a little bit, and then we'll pull it out and uh, shoot it downrange. Um, there's a couple of key features inside the weapon system that, that we call over the beach features, and these allow the gun, uh, gives it a level of safety. Uh, so if the, the gun is transported through the water, dropped in the mud, what have you, uh, buried in a sandstorm, uh, the gun's still going to function at the end of all that. All right, now do not try this at home. We're trained professionals and we have safety measures in place. This is definitely a stunt you don't try in your own backyard. Robbie, go for it. One of the things a gun like a 416, a piston gun brings to the table if you get in something like water, is you don't have to worry about the water getting up in that gas tube on a direct impingement weapon system. The problem there is if you were to fire the gun out of the water on say a standard M4 or M16, you always run the risk of that water being in there, that gas comes in, it ruptures the gas tube. That's a major, major concern. And that's why anytime you're in and around water with a conventional direct impingement gas system, you have to drain the water out of it. The HK416, because of the pusher rod system and the short stroke piston, you don't have a lot of those concerns. Uh, additionally, there's, you know, we'll do barrel testing and everything with the bolts barrel. Uh, so it's going to it's going to hold up a lot better coming out of the water and firing. It's kind of a niche need, but albeit it's a need that is required for certain members of the special operations community. Light yep. it up. Impressive, dude. That's where the gas piston operation really pays off. Yeah, absolutely. You don't have to worry about any of the capillary action in the gas tube or nothing like that. That's impressive. Yep. 
And I mean, we could do it all day long with this. It's uh, it's really it's a good safety feature for the gun. Um, it just it lets you know as a, as a user that you can put this gun through some serious abuse and it's it's the gun is still going to function. Now, is this something that HK did on their own or was this at a request to end users like uh, Naval Special Warfare or anybody like uh, that? Basically, it's it's at a request to improve the gun so that it can be done and, and swam with. Uh, but it's something that HK basically did on their own as far as to increase the performance of the weapon system. Now. Was this a 416 specific style modification, or is this something they've done in the past on other guns, or do you know? Uh, well, with the 416, that's where they put the OTB measures into place. Uh, I'm not sure if they've done it in the past before that or not. Cool. We'll get ready for the next test coming up. Well done, Robbie. That was way cool. All right, Robbie, the next test, world famous HK sand test, correct? Correct. Talk us through it. Uh, basically what we'll do is we'll uh, take the HK416, we'll load this up, uh, we'll bury it with sand, and then um, we'll pull it up out of the sand and, and shoot the target. Cool. Now, is this part of your little demonstration kit you bring um, on the road? Yeah, typically we're, we're not usually doing a lot of the sand and water tests. Uh, we'll usually just use video footage to show folks what the, the gun's capable of doing. Um, however, yep, you see it right here, so we got the capability to do that. All right, bro, go at it. Alrighty. The sand test, as we've seen, the M4, M16 style weapon actually does very well in this. And the 416 is certainly no exception. The gun is very sealed up, especially when you close the ejection port. And HK does extensive testing on their small arms in a variety of conditions. And I knew when it went through the sand test, it would be no issues at all. I've seen that movie before I knew how it ended. It's a very closed gun. And interestingly enough, the M14 or the M1 Garand has a fantastic reputation for reliability, but it is much more exposed to the elements, especially in a sand or dirt or debris environment than the M16 or the M4 or the HK416 is. The features of the 416, basically you're, you're, you're closing up the operating system to the exposure to the sand, and that's really one of the main things, uh, with, you know, whether it's with the dust cover or the rail system. Uh, all your internals, uh, you're, you're keeping the sand out of those areas. Nice. Clear. Well done. I know one of the things early on, TAC TV viewers might find this interesting, when they first were doing the 416 at the time it was called HKM4, they had some issues with the, the spring up there and getting debris in it, so they had to come up with the correct spring coils so that debris did not affect the pusher rod. Yeah, it could very well be possible. Now, obviously, they fixed yeah. that a long time ago. Yeah. Gun runs like a champ. Of course, we expected it to do exactly what it did. Well done. Next up, Robbie has some key details about the HK416 operating system. Robbie? Basically what we're gonna do here is uh, we're gonna remove the, uh, the rail system off the front of the gun um, to expose the, uh, the inner workings of the gas piston and the operating rod so we can actually show you how that's actually working uh, when it's being fired. Good deal, brother. Light it up. Now, one thing we can show the folks at home is this still remains very cool to the touch. Obviously, you wouldn't want to touch the barrel, right? nor would you want to touch the gas piston, but you can touch the pusher rod with no problem. Yep, yeah, pusher rod's fine. Um, it's, yeah, it's not hot at all. Good deal, and that translates, as we will see, into less heat in the bolt carrier group. Yep, absolutely. Cool, that's next up. On this training tip brought to you by Daniel Defense, I'm gonna to talk to you about the proper use of an extended rail. The gun is HK's MR556A1, and the rail is Daniel Defense's new rail for the HK416. It's also adaptable on the civilian MR556. 
It's extended, it gets you out past the gas block. It's also lighter and smaller in its modular, meaning you can put the rail sections where you want them. It was developed at the request of some special operations forces using the HK416, it's just now coming on the market. I get farther out on the gun, actually to the point where I'm up near the gas block, hence why I need an extended rail. And I wanna make sure I always pull the gun straight back in my shoulder, no matter what your position, standing, kneeling, prone, shooting on the move, whatever. The best compensator you have going for you is the ability to pull that gun straight back in the shoulder, as if you're driving a stake through your shoulder. If you do that, you'll control this gun much better than any other technique that I've seen. Now the trend in rails today, and this one's a good example, are smaller, lighter diameter and modular. And that allows you to put the rails where you want them and then you don't have the rails where you don't need them. Robbie, what's up next? Uh, what we're going to show you next, Larry, is the operating system, the HK416. We'll do a series of magazines with a lot of uh, short bursts and full auto fire. Uh, at the end of that, we'll break the, the weapon open and we'll show you the bolt carrier to show you how that there is a, uh, uh, not a lot of heat transfer and not a lot of carbon following on the bolt carrier group and how that's uh, a benefit to the system. Cool. Cleared hot, bro. Now when it comes to heat or a lot of fully automatic fire, a gun like the 416 is going to do better than a direct impingement gun or I would even argue a gun like an AK where the gas piston is essentially attached to the bolt carrier because remember that radiated heat can come all the way back through the bolt carrier into the bolt. Now certainly in a direct impingement gun, that's one of the things about it. If you shoot a lot of fully automatic fire, you're going to heat the gun up big time. That leads to you know, less life in terms of the operating components and it dries out your lubricant. That's where the advantages of something like a 416 or a gas piston system comes in. So the majority of the heat's actually kept up inside the gas block area or towards the end of the barrel. It's getting rid of about 90, 95% of the hot carbon following in that heat uh, out the front of the gun. So your operating rod is not transferring all that heat back to your bolt carrier, your bolt group, and that's allowing the system to run a lot cleaner and a lot smoother. There's less heat transfer, there's less carbon following, and, and it, it maintains the parts a lot longer that way, and it's a cleaner running system. No surprise, because of that, the HK416, now known as the M27, won the Marine Corps Infantry Automatic Rifle contract because it allows the operating mechanism of the gun to remain cooler that allows you a higher sustain rate of fire so if it's a gun that you know you're going to be shooting a lot of fully automatic fire on a, a piston gun like the 416 is a distinct advantage okay we are clear and as you can see the guns uh the, the front of that piston is, is definitely steaming and definitely hot we'll break that open we actually get to the bolt itself. You want to grab that? Yep. There's hardly anything to it Core at all. Core to the touch and relatively clean. Yep. That's the benefit to the piston operation. You don't get the heat transfer coming back through the operating mechanism into the reciprocating parts in the receiver. And that's allowing us to get a, a much higher sustained rate of fire uh, and less cook off uh, with more rounds for the gun. And this is one of the reasons why this gun in, in a different format was adopted as the M27 by the Marine Corps. Yes, the infantry yep. Corps. correct. Yep. That's one of the benefits to it. Yep. Excellent, dude. Thank you much. Yep. Appreciate it. Okay, it's time for me to take you through where the operating system for the HK416 came from. Because essentially, other than the operating system, it's an M4. Now, it all started back in the day with the Soviets when they designed the SVT-38 and the SVT-40 battle rifles. They were somewhat of a failure in World War II, but one thing that did carry over was the operating system on that particular rifle. The gas system carried over to this lineage, and the operating system, meaning the bolt lockup, carried over to the FNFL. And what I have here is an AR-180, which is a semi-automatic version of the AR-18. It has an SVT-40 style operating system with a pusher rod, return spring, and a gas piston which is fixed and a cup that fits over top of it. What ends up happening? When it comes back far enough, it vents gas underneath the handguard. Now, HK saw this operating mechanism on the AR-18 or AWAR-180, including the bolt and bolt carrier, adapted it and put their own spin with it on the G36. Now the bolt carrier and bolt are very similar between the two. Return spring is a little bit different, but when you look at the pusher rod and the gas piston, it's very similar. Big difference that HK did, 
they have a nipple on the front of their gas piston that vents the excess gas out the front. Now the unique thing about that, it becomes somewhat self-regulating. So it kind of adjusts to the different gas pressure of the rounds that you're firing. And whatever time it takes to push it back to cycle the action, that's what it needs and it vents off the rest of the gas. It's also why when they adapted that same gas system over to the 416, or in this case, the MR556A1, that's why the rail has to come off in order to access the gas system, much like the G36 handguard has to come off. And with the AR-180 or AR-18, you have to take the top handguard off. You have to access the gas system through the rear, not through the front, on something like an FNFAL per se. That's where this lineage came from, and it's also the reason why the very little heat transfer and the heat carbon fouling, by and large, stay up in the gas piston area. You don't have to worry about it coming back in the operating group. This is where it came from. Technically, it's a gas tappet system, but if you want to know the lineage on the 416, right here it is. Well, if you're a fan of the HK416, you definitely want to come in next episode because we have the M27 Infantry Automatic Rifle variant of the 416, recently adopted by the U.S. Marine Corps as their automatic rifle. You definitely don't want to miss it. First time ever on television.